And hi, everybody. Um, we are so very excited to have you here for our very first sustainability of the semester. Um, if you've been to sustainability in the past, we have changed our structure a little bit um, coming into spring 2021. Um, we are focusing more so on connecting with uh, community leaders in sustainability or sustainability <laughs> um, and offering a more intimate connection to find some more career paths and see what you can do within the field of sustainability. Um, so before we head into our conversation, Annie is just going to go over some housekeeping. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page about everything. Yeah, so I feel like everyone's going to do a good job because everyone has so far. Um, but if everyone wouldn't mind just keeping your questions in mind or putting them in the chat so that you don't forget them, but waiting uh, until we have the Q&A for the end and then keeping yourself muted, which you're all doing awesome at. And then just like Maya mentioned, we are recording it just so that we can have it with kind of our video archive. Um, of all the events and programs that we do. So that's just kind of a heads up. And it is gonna be put on our YouTube and Instagram pages if you wanna revisit it later or wanna show it to somebody or send it to somebody. So thanks for being here. So we are so lucky today to start off with Dan Crawford from the NC League of Conservation Voters. Um, the NC League of Conservation Voters is a nonpartisan organization uh, that strives to create a political environment to protect our natural environment. Um, Dan is an NC State grad where he obtained a BA in political science um, and currently serves as the Director of Governmental Relations. Um, if any of this has changed, feel free to correct me. I just took right off the website. Um, so before I go too much into um, about who you are, why don't you take it over? So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe your, ooh, your journey in sustainability to your current career? First off, I'll talk a little bit about NCLCV just for a second. Um, anytime I'm talking to folks like this, I just remind everybody that I'm a lobbyist, which is a code that I can talk all day long and get paid to talk. So this is going to be better if you guys take us some questions and we can, it's hard to have a back and forth, uh, but come up with some questions that way we can interact and I, I'm happy to answer questions and uh, have more of a dialogue if we can, uh, e even by Zoom. But NCLCV is one of the state's oldest environmental groups. And like Maya was saying, we decided many years ago that you could talk about the environment as much as you want, but it, unless you have a receptive audience, you're kind of wasting your breath. So in the late 90s, um, before y'all's time, before I was on board there, we decided to get into politics. And so now we say that we do the politics of the environment. We, we work to elect pro-conservation members to the North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, Nonpartisan, so if you're for the environment and you're a Republican, we support you. If you're for the environment and a Democrat, and we've become the state's largest uh, political advocacy group and state advocacy group in the, in, in the political arena. So uh, we've, uh, we're pretty good at what, what we do, I think. And the other part of my job is not only, uh, not just the political side, but also I'm a lobbyist. So I lobby at the General Assembly. Uh, as you may know, the General Assembly just started back in session yesterday. Uh, it's an odd numbered year, so it's the long session. And so we, we will be working, I'll be working with leaders in North Carolina House and Senate to you know, protect our environment, clean air, clean water. But now to actually answer the question, uh, you know, what was your journey into sustainability been like? Um, you know, uh, it's a great question. And, you know, when I first saw it, when I got the slide deck, you know, what came to my mind is when I came over to the League of Conservation Voters, it's uh, approaching 14 years now, someone said to me, it's like, I didn't know you were a tree hugging hippie. Um, and, and I kind of laughed and I was like, well, I'm not. But, you know, I was born in the mountains of North Carolina. And so the, the, the environment to me is like a birthright. Uh, you know, it's growing up in the mountains, you know, running all over the mountains and streaks and streams and creeks, rivers and lakes. I mean, you know, it was just something we had. And then as, as we as I grew and saw that, you know, the, the environment is something that we have to work to protect. It just that uh, it just doesn't happen naturally as we would want it to be. You know, that, that's how I came to NCLCV. But, you know, before that, I'll, I'll even go we'll go in the way back in the time machine. My first job out of college, uh, I went to NC State, if you couldn't tell by me being here in the state man cave over, over my shoulder. Um, 
my first job after I graduated from college was at the North Carolina General Assembly. And I went to work for a state senator from the mountains who, who was my state senator. And I, I come from a very apolitical family. Uh, you know, my, parent, my grandparents raised me and they didn't even vote. Um, so when I got a political science degree from NC State, I was like, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with a political science degree? I, I think they thought I was going to go manage a Papa John's or something because, you know, it's a political science degree. And I told them, I was like, I'm going into politics. And like, nobody goes into politics. So needless to say, when I got my first job right out of college of politics, I called several people up and told them to kiss my ass. Uh, I'm in politics now, and that's where I've been 21 years. Um, and, and I'm fortunate enough to say that it feels like I've never worked a day in my life because I love what I do every day. Um, but the first job at the General Assembly, my member, uh, Senator Metcalf, we started working on the Clean Smokestacks Act. On, and at some point, you may, you may come across that in some of your environmental classes, but it gave North Carolina some of the most stringent clean air laws in the country. And you know, at the time, it, you know, my first day on the job was a sit down between the, the utility industry and the environmentalist. And we walked out of that meeting and the senator told, leaned over to me and said, hey, son, stuff like that don't happen every day down here. You don't tell anybody what you just saw in that room and that was the start of the Clean Smokestacks Act. Uh, I think four years later, the, the bill became law. And like I said, North Carolina had some of the most stringent clean air laws in the country. And my part of that was working on mercury reduction from coal-fired power plants. And you know, I joke, I'm a political scientist, not a real one. Um, but during that process, I, I worked with state epidemiologists. I worked with health departments. And I learned so much about mercury and that, I guess that's kind of my really my first professional foray into the environment. And I, was, I just loved it. Um, you know, it, it just seemed like a natural fit for me, like I said, because working to protect the environment was really fun. And, you know, as, as I said, you know, my mom still works in a manufacturing plant, but I, I feel like I've never worked a day in my life because every day I get to wake up and go work to protect our environment. So that, that's kind of a Cliff Notes version of my journey to sustainability. Um, I will, I do have to admit that um, the job I had before coming over to the North Carolina Youth Conservation Voters, I did lobby for a utility company. And so the joke is I worked there for a year and a half and then I had to come get my soul back right with God. And so here I am 14 years later and I still don't have my soul back because I'm still going hard for the environment to try to, to try to undo all the bad I did with the utility company. Now I joke, the utility company was not a bad utility company. We, we did not, we did not um, own our own baseload generation, but I represented cities and towns that own and operate their own electric systems. Um, so it's, uh, it puts me in a very unique position to lobby for the environment as I know the utility side better than most environmentalists. And it also means a lot, oftentimes that the utilities like to work with me because I can bring my knowledge of their industry and try to explain it to my folks. And that's all the times what I tell people, I'm a translator. I translate nerd into legislature, legislator because you know we can have some long reports on TNDLs, total maximum daily loads of chemicals and stuff. I, I got one friend of mine who, who has graduated from Yale and Berkeley and one time he gave me this 10 page report he wanted to give me to legislators. And I'm like, what, what is this? I was like, there, there's over 2000 bills in the North Carolina General Assembly. I can't give this to a legislator and expect them to read it. I was like, we need to translate this. And so I took it and I asked him some questions and I, I took his nerd that was 10 pages long and I translated it down to two paragraphs, uh, which was less than a page. Uh, something that a member would read. And I'm like, we, we can't give members 10 pages of stuff like this. So that, that, that's a long answer to my journey into sustainability has been like. I loved hearing all that. That's your <laughs> that was very awesome. I'm a big talker, so I appreciate it. Um, kind of moving a little bit, you've touched on this, but more specifically, um, what was it specifically about the League of Conservation Voters that really drew you to it and and kind of made you think it was the right fit for you? So I touched on this a minute ago, but I, I'll expand on it. 
I, I'm not at this organization. I literally have two jobs. So before I became on board, there was two different people doing the job that I'm doing now. One of them was the lobbyist, and one of them was the political person. If you look at my resume, uh, you know my resume is shows all the stuff that I talked about. So it shows that I can do any of the things. What I didn't talk about my resume was after I left the General Assembly, I got into politics and I've, I've ran campaigns uh, as high as the congressional level. I've been involved in campaigns, you know, obviously at the state level, the congressional level. So I've done the, a lot of politics in my career. And then you, you back that with um, after uh, some time in politics, I worked for a member of Congress for several years. So I got to do policy. And, and like I said, th this job really is two jobs in one where I, I get to do the lobby and policy side of stuff, but also I get to do the, the political side of it. And so that's what really drew me to the job because it, gets, it allows me to do both jobs. I like one a lot more than the other. And I joke that I'm a lot better at one part of my job than I am the other. So with this, uh, as someone that's self-diagnosed ADHD, I get to do a little bit of everything every day of my life. Uh, so like today is a great example today, you know, looking at the General Assembly, working on some bills, working on to get some members of the Senate to sign on to a letter opposing um, a gas facility, a, a, um, transitioning a um, hog lagoons into biogas down in Sampson and Duplin counties. You know, so that, that's kind of my lobbying side of my job. But then also the, I um, don't know how closely you've been following, but North Carolina Secretary of DEQ, Michael Regan, is being appointed to lead the EPA by President Biden. I've been working on that since December and getting him appointed to that position. And now we're working closely with the governor to get a new Secretary of DEQ. And so I've been working with the governor's office on the process uh, of getting, you know, they started out with some names and they're, they're starting to winnow it down and working on getting the next secretary of DEQ appointed. So that right there just describes what I love about my job the most. At any given day, I get to do a little bit of politics. I get to do a little bit of lobbying and policy. So it's, it's the perfect blend. And, you know, now, I, you know, getting to do it at home, it's, it, I find it even more fun because I, you know, I can dress up and get my NC State shirt on and not have to put a suit on, which I always say is the least part of my, the least favorite part of my job is the dress code. So I, I, I'm in heaven getting to work from home and uh, hang out with my kids all day. So you sound like you do a lot. <laughs> um, I, I, I do a lot. I do a lot all the time. Uh, so it's, um, and I love it. Like I said, it, it doesn't even feel like work to me. So sort of bouncing off of that, um, what do you feel like you learned in your classes that you use most in your career? You know, a bunch of us are seniors or looking into more of our job and internship prospects and wondering how we can use our degrees. Um, so can you just touch a little bit on that and specifically like what you learned in your classes? I mean, a lot of things I learned, you know, I think this is always a tough question, and uh, I often get ins invited to speak to the incoming class of CHAS students, College of Humanities and Social Science students at NC State, and this is a question that they ask a lot. And, you know, unlike if I were an engineer, um, where there, there is black and white math and dynamics and uh, math, uh, which I, I'm not into, um, that you know you learn to take into your career when, when you're doing a lot of engineering, that's less applicable to what I do and what a lot of you know social science is. And so, oftentimes my answer to this is just I, I learned the history of politics. Um, you know, I graduated NC State in 2000, and here it is, some 21 years later, I can still remember like a fight I had with a professor. His name was Michael Demick. He was an asshole. I'm sure you guys have had asshole professors in, in, in your collegiate careers. Uh, we were reading a book. It was by Samuel Popkin. Again, 21 years later, and this is like scarred in my brain. Um, and it was about elections and campaigning. And you know what skill I learned was to think 
and, and to argue and to, you know, make my point um, when I, I thought it was time to make my point. And, and I remember reading that book. Uh, I, it, it really, I do need to get some help because it's 21 years later and I still can't let this go. Um, but he was talking about campaigns and elections. And at the time I'd already been on some campaigns working on them. And every day in class, my hand went up. I'm like, Dr. Demick, that, that, that's just not right. That's bullshit. That, that doesn't happen in a, in a real campaign setting. Like you guys are nerds and you need to get out, get out of this classroom, get your nose out of a book and learn some practical skills when it comes to campaigning. And, and you know, it's, it's funny that I say that now, but it's still a fight that I still have with many of the professors at NC State who I'm friends with now, which is another weird thing. Like if I would have been friends with professors when I was in college, I probably would have done a lot better at being in college. But um, I'm uh, friends with a lot of these guys and, I, and I, I still argue the point with them that, you know, they need to get out of the classroom a little bit more. And, you know, I know their job is oftentimes to teach theory but you know, if you get out of the classroom and get some practical experience blended with that theory, it's gonna be much uh, more productive for the students in the learning process. So I think the skills I learned, I mean, you know, I, I still learned a lot of history of politics from Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, uh, touring the South, um, obviously the history of what happened in the country, but just, you know, knowing that makes me better at my job. And so, you know, I look at my bookshelf and, you know, oftentimes for fun now for reading, I will go to some you know, top political science uh, programs in the country, whether it be, you know, I, I started NC State, obviously that's my home school, but then I, I will look at Berkeley and M, um, Harvard, uh, Dartmouth, some other schools like that. And I will go to their pol pol uh, political science uh, websites and see what books the professors are having their students read. And I will add those books to my reading list because I always want to continue to grow and learn that theory and learn the history because I think it, it, I think it makes me better at what I'm doing, especially on the lobbying side. You know, they know the history of um, big bills that have passed in our country, you know, whether it be the Civil Rights Act or environmentally, like the, the Clean Air Act, um, you know, and apply some of the some of the things that made them successful in becoming law. I mean, I think that's the uh, outside of just the ability to think and argue and, you know, communicate is, uh, I think, the best way to answer that, class, that question. And, you know, communication is paramount uh, in this industry, whether I'm communicating with, with a legislator or a farmer in the field, just learning how to communicate is something that, that the class has taught me. I told, I told you I could talk a lot. We're happy that you can. <laughs> um, I love those answers. Those are, I, communication is definitely super important. And I love that you keep up with the books um, that are, you know, being used now. My, of, my grades would have been way better if, if, if I would have did as much reading in college as I did out of college. I, there's no doubt I would have been much better student. We can all take notes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, kind of you, I feel like you've touched on this throughout, um, but building off of that, what are some skills that you have found that you needed in your different jobs that you've held that you didn't learn in class and that you maybe had to kind of like adjust to or figure out on your own um, throughout your career so far? Yeah, so the, the one of the biggest one is one I just hit on, that's communication. Um, I, I started out in college um, at Mars Hill College. It's a small college up in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I went there on a baseball scholarship. And a couple of the communication classes that I took, I mean, not there uh, is one. And then I took one at NC State that was uh, about uh, writing. And here I am, you know, again, 21 years later, and I still remember a lot of the components of those classes. And I, I will visit um, you know, some of the stuff that I taught that, that those two classes taught me. So, you know, communication, I think is paramount, especially in today's world, uh, regardless of what industry you're going into. Um, and, you know, that, that's a multi, multi-faceted uh, thing to say, right? Communication, it's not just writing, 
you got to be able to write, you got to be able to talk, you, you got to be able to, you know, be on a Zoom call for several hours a day, as, as we've learned in the past year. Um, so practicing communication skills, you know, if I was in a job interview, excuse me, if I was in a job interview right now and somebody, you know, you get the proverbial what skill or something that do you want to improve on, I'm going to give you an answer. I'm going to cheat, give you an answer. Always say communication because that's always the right answer. Uh, you know, I ask that question when I'm hiring people and communication is something that you can always, you can say that you're, you're a good communicator, but it's always something that you can continue to work on and grow on. And so communication is huge. The other thing that I, I think folks that I didn't, uh, I didn't learn in class was but how to network. Um, th that, that's key is, you know, who you meet. Uh, that first job I got at NC, uh, at the North Carolina State Senate, um, I think this is a kind of funny story. I, um, I got that job, I, I was at a bar drinking on, on a Friday night. And at the time, I'd already been an intern with the uh, North Carolina, I was an intern with the North Carolina Democratic Party. And I was at a bar on Hillsborough Street. Um, and I bumped into uh, one of the people I met there. And she was like, hey, what are you doing with your life? And at the time, I was selling luggage at the mall, working my way through college. And she was like, I know you don't want to sell luggage the rest of your life. I'm like, well, no, I want to go into politics. And she worked for that state senator that gave me my first job. And she said, well, come down to the General Assembly on Monday. We're hiring for a position. And so that's how I got my first job. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't responding to an ad and a paper. I wasn't responding to an a, email or indeed or a job board i literally bumped into somebody i knew at a bar on a friday night and that's how that first job came about and moreover that first job i, I started working there um just uh, the the influences the members of the senate have i started working there and like a week later i filled out like an application um yeah uh, I, I started working there then like a week later i filled out an application because it was it was a time to get paid, so the senator would like hire me basically on the spot, and so networking, 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 and a, a key to that is be nice to everybody you know, because you never know when they're going to be in a position to help you out. You know, I, I, like I'm clearly I'm a Democrat. Um, my wife is, for full disclosure, is is a state senator. Um, you know, I I, I don't drink the Kool-Aid for Democrats, I make it. But when I'm guest lecturing, you know, at NC State and somebody comes up and, you know, they're, they're, it's a student always, and you know, I, I could tell they're kind of beating around the bush. Like, hey, look, you're a Republican, right? And you want to ask me how to get into that politics. And like, I, I ring off, I, like, I connect with the Republican people I know. So I'll always be, I try to be nice to everybody. And you know, you never know when you're meeting somebody that's going to affect your future. And that, that's just happened. Like every job I've gotten is, I could tell a similar story to that one about meeting and seeing that seeing Angie at the bar on Hillsborough Street. Um, you know, after that, it, it's uh, it, it's all about who you meet, how you treat people, and so those skills you can't learn, learn in class. I promise you, but th they're ones that will follow you for life. That is really great advice. Um, definitely agree with the communication thing, just from past interviews and everything. Um, moving on from that, you've touched on this a little bit academically, but what's maybe one piece of advice you wish someone told you before getting into your career? A um, couple, couple things I wish I would have known. I, I wish I would have known more about the networking. Um, luckily, that a lot of that happened. Uh, by accident, but yeah, you know, I wish somebody you know would have told me to network. And I, I will tell you like how crazy I am about networking and, and keeping my skills sharp. I've applied for jobs that I didn't want just so I could get an interview, so I could practice my interviewing skills. Like I, I mean that, that that's crazy. And like like so much so like I, I'll go tell my boss it's like, hey, I've applied for a job. I'm not leaving. I just want to practice my interview skills. 
So uh, as a recovering college athlete, you know, practice makes perfect. And so networking and getting out meeting people um, goes in, the, you know, like I said, practicing those skills that, that I'm going to need the rest of my life um, is something no one told me. The other thing I wish I would have known to do or would have known more about is like I, I would have um, explored um, studying abroad or taking a semester off or doing something like that because, you know, like I was the first person in my family to go to college. So I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't have any like family, you know, background pushing me or advising me. So, you know, it's, it's almost like beat, beating in your head to, to go four years and out, get in there and get out. But I wish I would have known. And for the record, I didn't do that. I was not, I, I did not do four and out. Um, I transferred and uh, took the scenic route. Uh, in fact, most people joked and said most people in college, as long as I was, are called doctors, uh, not, not just uh, graduates. So, um, so th that's kind of the advice I would have. You know, net learning to network and practice the skills that's going to that's going to follow you follow you throughout life um, is something that, that again, no one don't they, they don't tell you that, but it, it's important. And you know, at a place like UNCW, th there's going to be lots. Of Lots of opportunities or, or any college right uh, any college there's going to be opportunities to meet folks uh, you know it's probably a little bit difficult now in COVID times but you know find something you're interested in go to a zoom meeting or you know go to a safe meeting and you know you, you never know who's going to be at that meeting that could help you or you never know like who's the person uh, when I guess lecture at state sometimes I'll ask the, the class depending on the size like how many people in this classroom can name five of their classmates' names? How many people in this class can name 10 of their classmates' names? And, you know, you, you're really surprised at how many, like, people just don't know the people in their class. And I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you people? Like, my dad might be, you know, the, the head of uh, Pfizer, and you want to go into pharmaceutical cells. So get up, get your ass out of your seats every once in a while and meet the people around you because you don't know how they, they can possibly help you down the road. And, and not just, it's not just, you don't do it just because it helps you, just do it because it makes you a better human being, right? I love that mindset. <laughs> I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> um, and thank you for all of that. Like, that is super helpful. This is the last question that we we have prepared for you. Um, but then after this, we can move on and see if any of our guests have any questions um but just kind of what are some ways that students if they're interested can get involved with the league of conservation voters and what opportunities do you have available or like for like volunteering jobs internships any of really anything that you have in mind we we want to hear about so take it yeah so first I, I, i'll tell you guys you should make sure you have some questions or otherwise this is going to be a 27 minute answer and th that's not going to be good for anybody. Um, I'm going to start reading uh, the dictionary. Before, um, no, I do not need to read the dictionary. Um, one day, uh, before I answer the question, we lobbied. We were working on coastal uh, stormwater rules. And for about 10 hours, we lobbied over the word shall versus the word may. Uh, 10 hours. There was a room of about 85 people. There was four people, four Coastal stormwater management rules. I was on. I was one of those four, and they were about eighty against. And for ten hours, we uh, fought over the word "shall" versus "may." So, um, I'm happy to make this a twenty-six minute answer if I have to, but I, I don't think I'm going to have to. So, first off, you know, we're, we're a nonprofit, uh, and we're a small nonprofit, and you know, a lot of challenges facing small nonprofits is, you know, like I've already said, that I, I do two jobs. Um, so. You know, we, we don't have any formalized internship programs um, in, in our office. Uh, people reach out to me and, you know, ask if they can be involved. You know, we do have one affiliation through a donor uh, through Duke University. So over the summer that we will have a couple of interns come in the office. I'll usually have one or two. So th that's kind of the bad thing about uh, working for a, a small nonprofit is that you know, during my time when I was a student, I could never take an unpaid uh, internship because, again, I, I come from humble beginnings, so I had to work my way through college. So I, I, I would have never been able to um, 
taking a paid internship. And that's what I always say that, you know, when I win that $1 billion lottery going on, I'm going to start like a program for, you know, kids that can't afford to take unpaid internships so they can get experiences they needed in life. So, but like I said, we don't have anything uh, formal, uh, you know, folks reach out to me and I'm happy to help all the time. But what I tell other people or what, what I tell people is just find an organization you're interested in and reach out to them because like us, you know, a lot of the programs, a lot of the organizations that share our values on sustainability are going to be nonprofits. And so that means they may not have something formal, but if you reach out, you might find that they have something informal. And, you know, like us, you know, a lot of groups are there to work with you and they're happy to have you. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little more difficult in COVID because if, you know, if it were non-COVID times, you know, we have an office to go to. Um, folks typically like to come hang out with me for some reason and follow me at the General Assembly. Um, and you know, watch me work at the General Assembly, but re just reach out again. Use those skills that we already talked about: the communication and networking to find out what people have. You know, just because it's not listed doesn't mean it's not there, or there might not be an opportunity there. So you know, again, whatever the issue is, environment, other issues of sustainability, coastal issues. You know, th there's folks out there doing the work that may need some help, um, maybe a you may be able to volunteer or intern with. And, you know, that's the same, same thing that I tell folks that are looking in politics, find a campaign, find somebody that's running for office that you like or can get behind, volunteer. Um, that's the way I did it. Uh, you know, I uh, started volunteering for the North Carolina Democratic Party. And, you know, when I was doing that, um, I, I tell the story that, it was the 2000 election. I believe it was the 2000 election. Uh, North Carolina hosted a debate um, in Winston-Salem at Wake Forest. And all of a sudden, we were at the party headquarters one day and we got a call. And Hadassah Lieberman, Joe Lieberman's wife, was going to come to the North Carolina Democratic Party headquarters to watch the debate. And everybody lost their shit because we weren't prepared for that to happen. And so we, we literally needed to clean the house. It's, it's, a, it's an old house here in downtown Raleigh. Um, and we literally needed to clean the house. So I remember like being downstairs, you know, on my hands and knees, cleaning the toilet like I would at my home or my apartment. But right next in the stall beside me was the executive director of the North Carolina Democratic Party. So again, just tied all together, you know, when you meet people, give them your best, show them their best. And, you know, we've known each other for 21 years and every once in a while we'll bring up that, hey, remember the time we were like scrubbing the toilets before Hadassah Lieberman came to the party to watch the debate? Um, so I'll always give your best when you do get a volunteer opportunity, when you do get an internship opportunity. And I think you'll find people, you know, willing to work with you and help you as, as much as they can. It was not a 26 minute answer. So I'm giving you guys some time to ask questions. So you're welcome. Thank you for that. Yeah, if anybody has questions, feel free to just say them or put them in the chat or anything like that. 